All right, John Middlecoff, the volume, former NFL scout, Arizona resident. What's going on, brother? You know, just enjoying life. Uh, I, I was just in the sauna, and I had the uh, Kelsey podcast going. I thought, you know, I'll last 15 minutes in here. It won't be that long. I, I didn't even – I listened to, like, half of it. I had to get out to keep the like, sauna talk for 75 minutes. What's going on in the sauna? What you got? You got podcasts going on? Do you have speakers going into the sauna? No, I, no, no. This is uh, a gym one. I just left the headphones in so I don't have to interact yeah, with yeah, any yeah, humans. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I was of thinking, like, you know, I could listen to some yeah. of this to react of for course. the podcast. And he just kept going and going. Yeah. I mean, it, it's. And he, then he announced it at the end. He was retiring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you were an Eagle Scout. That sounds great. It sounds, you were an Eagle Scout. Well, wow, you uh, could, like, make a canoe. Um, you were an Eagle Scout during the drafting of Jason Kelsey and during the part, the early part of his career. Now you're a pro scout, I believe during the actual draft. And then you became a college scout after that. So it's not like you were uh, in a van cross-checking Jason Kelsey, but what do you remember about the evaluation inside the building? Uh, and what do you remember about his arrival? Well, I think Howard Mudd was hired my second year. Mm -hmm. Who's probably one of the more legendary assistant coaches in the history of the league. And he had a big belief in athleticism when it came to linemen. Yeah. I, Kelsey mentioned this on his yeah. press conference. And size wasn't something that, you know, pushed him away from certain players if you had the athleticism. Because at the time, he was, I think, like 275, 280 pounds. And he, he lasted for the sixth round for a reason. Half the league probably didn't even have him as a draftable player. Honestly, mm -hmm. more than half. And I think you got to go back to some of the offensive linemen that – Indianapolis won with with Peyton Manning are, are not household names. Yep. It's not a bunch of Lane Johnsons, Jason Peters, and Trent Williams, right? Or even just guards and centers, yep. right? A lot of random guys. Now, Jason transcended that, but he yep. was viewed, and the moment he was drafted, like if Howard had his say, he was going to be the starting center. Mm -hmm. And that's what turned out to happen. So he gets there a little bit. I, I think Travis coming out of the draft, and he said this before, yep. was a huge red flag. Huge red flag. A lot of issues. Jason was more just like a crazy guy, but not a questionable guy. Like Travis had been in trouble. I think a lot of people had Jason somewhat red flag. Just could you control him? And I, I think he, a lot like his brother, went to the perfect place. Andy Reid, you're not really screwing around on his watch. And for Jason specifically, he had a belief I mean, his two offensive line coaches he's ever had are his biggest believers in Howard Mudd and then Jeff Stoutland. And then clearly, you know, once he met his wife, he became one of the greatest players of all time. <laughs> I, I love that whole thing. He was so thoughtful and and I, I he's like a terrific, I saw the point on Twitter, like he's a terrific writer. Like his turns of phrase were good. Like everything was good. Um, Daniel Jeremiah was on this podcast uh, a couple of, of months ago and he said that he learned so much from that draft because they drafted Danny Watkins early and they drafted Jason Kelsey late. Danny Watkins didn't love football. Jason Kelsey obviously lived and breathed it and was consumed by it. Um, I, I guess my question is how do you scout for like love of the game? How do you, how do you say like this guy is going to be t crying about how much he loves the city of Philadelphia in, in 12 years. And this guy's going to be fighting fire. I think anytime that humans are your assets, you're always going to have a coin flip when mm -hmm. it comes to that. Cause you can be fooled. When I was in Philly, we used to call them kind of cons <laughs> guys when they showed up for their visits during the draft would be in a suit. Yep. It's like, this guy has about seven off the field issues. So $5,000 suit. When the dude who's never been yeah. in trouble just shows up and like his yeah. college team sweats and doesn't get Bobby Wagner just walks through the room in a Ninja Turtle backpack. You're like, yeah, he's not worried about anything. But the guys, so it, it, it happens in any company, anyone listening to this, I don't care what industry you're in. It's pretty easy. And you see all these like firms that acquire businesses. It's pretty black and white. Like this yep. company making money, this company not. Do they own the product? When you're hiring, whether it's a low level position or a high level position, it's difficult. It is not, it is not easy. And Danny Watkins, is a good example of it wasn't his age. Mm. It wasn't all the stuff. I think people talked about. I remember a story. I don't know if it was a preseason game or it might've been like the first couple regular season games. You know, the visuals, they always come out on NFL films mm -hmm. about a pregame in NFL mm -hmm. where everyone is just serious as a heart attack. Like no one's talking. Everyone's kind of at their locker. 
kind of tightening their their shoestrings and like making sure their pads are on and just kind of soaking in before they go to battle. He like got up and played the air guitar. I, I like so I don't even oh know my if gosh. Like, he turned the music on and and I remember the story. I wasn't in the locker room. Everyone looked at him like what is it, it was outrageous. And clearly there was a maturity slash love of football right. that 100% was not there where I think Jason Kelsey kind of represents mm-hmm. the NFL. <laughs> yes. You know, most of the NFL are third day picks who go on, maybe not to have a hall of fame level career, but go on to have long lucrative careers because they eat, breathe and sleep it. And they are just not going to take no for an answer. And sometimes it doesn't come easy. Maybe they're a couple of years on the practice squad. Maybe it takes them to a year three or four to break through. Maybe it's year one, like Kelsey. And even he talked about, I didn't become a really good player till later, but his love, and I think his brother falls under this too. It's like, it's hard to have balance as a football player mm-hmm. because the sport, you only play once a week, 17 weeks a year. The majority of your stuff is work. Weight room, yep. studying, practice. Like it kind of sucks. Ray, Ray Lewis, yep. you know, you pay me Monday through Saturday. I play yep. I play for free. Yep. And it's true because the games, even if you are an NFL player, college player, high school, the games are the one fun part about football. A lot of it, even if you love it, suck. Even like the Peyton Mannings have said like, yeah, at the end, it's just like, I didn't love the grind. Everyone likes playing the games. It's what you have to take. And I don't think even Jason talked about this. But clearly his body, the pounding he's been through at that position in the trenches as a smaller guy, I, I just think his body kind of tapped out, which is crazy because he's still playing at a high – like he doesn't think he can go through what needs to go through to keep doing this. Have you heard the Jason Kelsey, Ozzie Newsome story? No. All right, it's that uh, – Is so, Ozzie Newsome retired or yeah, not? Because I, he's, he's, in the, he, he's in the draft <laughs> rooms all the time. I'm not really, I'm not really sure, but this is before he – this is when he, he was – actively the GM of the, of the Baltimore Ravens. So there were a couple Kelsey's told all of these stories before, including, I believe a couple on this show um, where like he, uh, like the, one of the best ones is that he met with the Steelers and mean Joe green was in there. And he was he, like, he was just trying to lighten the mood and he was like, Oh, mean Joe green is here. And like, no one reacted at all. And like, I think he tried to make Belichick laugh and Belichick hated it, but he, he was a red flag guy as he says. And he said that, uh, that I <laughs> think there's, we were just not vibing with Ozzie Newsom at all. And Ozzie Newsom just goes, we, we bleep this out. So, so the listener will, will figure out what I'm about to say. But Ozzie Newsom just looks at him and says, son, are you a <laughs> And that was his question. <laughs> and it's like, sometimes that's a good way to figure out if a guy is a red flag guy or not. Um, Travis Kelsey, obviously, I mean, not a red flag guy. Um, but what I will say, you mentioned like the suit thing and how like a lot of times coaches are, you know, you can just tell that a guy is just, overcompensating for something um i remember this probably about a decade ago a scout telling me that he likes now the new thing is these guys are so overtrained for the combine interviews and the senior bowl interviews just they know exactly what to say their agent tells them and that the best thing to do is just let uncomfortable silence come in because the player will just blurt out whatever the opposite of their red flag is so like you'll just be sitting there for like the 90 seconds writing something down and the kid will be like I've never touched a drug in my life. And it's like, oh, okay, this guy probably had failed a couple of tests because they just no idea what yeah, to say. Yeah. And they just they just want to get it out there. The one thing they told me that there was this agent, I guess, I guess somebody was training these kids again, a decade ago, somebody, I, I guess maybe a GM had told an agent that they look for kids who have, who are close to their family, something like that, right? Clo- like close to their family, loving family, all of this stuff. And they got like eight kids that year who they would be like, so son, uh, tell me about your football philosophy. And the first thing they would say was just, so, well, I come from such a loving family coach. And uh, they always be like, what is this? How did this they start? They knew they had cracked the code. They they how did this code. start? What is going on here? Um, so anyway, that's 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 my uh, that, that's the intel I've gathered. And obviously, you, you know it uh, more than me. Having said that, you were just at the Combine. Um, and that's what I want to talk about here. How do you view the Combine? How, we'll start here. How did you view it when you were scouting? And how do you view it now? Uh, I, I guess when you're scouting guys that you like or guys your organization likes, it helps if they have a good week or a bad week, maybe so, because you can pay less for them in the draft. Yeah. But specifically, it's you've met the guy or your scouts have met the guy. 
but your head coach definitely has not. I mean, the coaching staffs haven't even watched these guys, beside maybe a, a couple series here and there throughout the season on Saturday when most of them are traveling. The GMs have watched them, but they have not met any of them. Mm-hmm. 99% of them. Maybe a, a weird, like, went to a game, met a guy. But if you're going to a game, you're probably not meeting the kid. Especially if, you know, you're just down on the sideline. You're not talking to any players. You're talking to coaches. So I think that interaction. I was talking to Andy. I was like, all these guys are tapping out. Right, but the, the Shanahan crews are too cool for school when it comes to the combine. And he's like, "Listen, I don't get much out of this. Right, the workouts mean nothing to us. We have it all on tape. We have all the information. If I didn't show up for the workouts, it wouldn't matter. The medical, I'm not a doctor. I don't even go to that. I, it's not my. I go for the 15 minutes to first meet when Trent McDuffie walks in or mm-hmm. Chris Jones walks in and and meet them and talk to them. And that's my first interaction with my coordinator." getting a feel, especially for the highly drafted guys. Mm -hmm. I've said this forever. Like I understand a lot of coaches don't like the dog and pony show. That's become the combine and they feel like they get paraded around. I I think that's what like McVay and Shanahan think. It's like, well, Belichick didn't miss one for 40 years. Andy Reid's won three of the last five Super Bowls and he's not missing this thing. Right. So Pete Carroll, when he was in the league, never missed this thing. There is value there. And there's a value because they go, well, I'm going to the meetings on Zoom, right? Because they pop up on a computer. It's like, Sean McVay here. Yeah. <laughs> like, Come on, guys. That's We all know in 2024 the difference of meeting someone in person, being there, and popping up on a Zoom meeting from 3,000 miles away. So I I can't get behind. And, and listen, maybe I'm old school in certain ways. Yeah. Like, I thought it was crazy not playing guys in the preseason. Now I've come around and agree with McVay. I do think there's value in meeting Six seventh rounders, whatever. But here's the thing about the coaches. Once they draft a guy and then they don't like him, they'll turn on the guy in like six months. It's like, well, where were you the whole entire process? Like, it's just start to finish. Like, it is a big deal. It's it's not because just because you went to the combine, you're more likely to hit on a guy. I just do think there's value. So from that standpoint, I I think there's huge value in just meeting the guy and talking to his teammates or people he played about him. I I think – First-hand interaction, not sitting there on an iPad. Having been in the league, I, I've, I've always heard different philosophies on this. I've had uh, front office guys say a GM's job is to get the coaches, the player, the players he wants. And I've heard other people say the GM's job is to build the best roster and let the coach sort it out. How much say should a coach have in personnel versus versus the GM? And I, I know that's a big question, but like Andy comes in, he meets these guys. If if he really overruled, I know it's collaborative. I remember Pete Carroll saying him and John Schneider literally never disagreed. And I think I understand collaboratively how that's possible. I mean, there's some doubt, I'm sure, about that. But like, I understand collaboratively how that's possible. But if, if Andy comes in, this is always the book on Belichick, that the Belichick would just call Urban Meyer and Greg Schiano a week before the draft and say, who do you like? And then they would end up drafting some kid from yeah. that. But And we saw how the process worked out. But like, GM versus coach and personnel, like, where do you fall on that? And where, where should teams fall on that? Well, I'd give you the Chiefs example. Yeah. Veach picks the players. Yeah. But he knows what Andy likes and exactly. the type of guys he likes. So they are tied at the hip and the knowledge they have and the streamlined ideas. If your coach doesn't like the guy, just cause you like him, who cares? Right. Once the guy's drafted, you're not in the, I remember Jim Washburn. It's like, well, it's easy to pound the table for this guy in the second round. That's a complete douchebag. <laughs> and then you guys celebrate yeah. in the draft room. And then I'm sitting with him for the next couple of years yeah. and I have to deal with them. And you just see him in the, in the cafeteria yeah. with a thumbs up, you know, <laughs> it's like, I, I, I do, you need the coach. There is no good GM without a good coach. And coaches, ideally, you guys have, and you see this all the time, right? You've been to a million training camps and talked to all these coaches when they talk about, like, I really feel great about our relationship. Yeah. And then the moment you start losing everyone points the finger, yeah. I think when you truly have a good relationship, I, I think John and Pete had a really good one. Did they it, agree on all players? How is that humanly possible? It, it's not. And maybe sometimes I wonder if John would tell you if he would have listened to me a couple more times, we wouldn't have had some of these issues. Andy and Veach are just not having those issues. And and I would say they have the most unique relationship right now in the league. I think Kyle and John and Les and Sean, there still is a power dynamic. One guy makes $15 million. The other guy like ultimately answers to that guy. Yeah. Yeah, So it's just where Veach, like Andy truly empowers him. And look at what happens now. Veach is really good. So it's, and, and Veach came very, from Philly and and was anointed by his, by Andy. Yeah. Started as his assistant. Yeah, you know, twenty plus years ago, their relationship is. 
probably unlike any in the NFL. There, there's going to be natural, you know, kind of a uh, pull both sides. One guy's going to want someone. And you ultimately have to figure out who is best to help the team and the coaching staff will work with. Now, and that also gets to, we need good coaches, mm-hmm. right? Because some coaches, whether it's laziness, whether it's just they're not as talented as others, whether they have a shorter attention span when it comes to dealing with people. Like, look at Jeff Stoutland. He was changing Kelsey's career in 2016. Yeah. Kelsey got drafted in what, like 2011? So it, it just shows you some guys see the big picture. Some guys push back against it. It's why it's very hard. It gets back to the draft, just like a coaching staff in front office. Human dynamics, you know, in and out works, just burgers and fries. It's not mm-hmm. that complicated. When, when you get a bunch of, the other thing is egos. Right, so mm-hmm. now you get these assistant coaches. I was, I stayed at the same hotel with the Giants. You know, Wink Martindale's making three, four million dollars. Dable's the coach of the year. Both of them have egos that, I, as I was told, could fit in another car separately as they drive to work. Their egos could be in the separate cars. So it's just that's where it gets complicated, and that's what I think undoes like a lot of like a lot. Most guys in the NFL have the physical capabilities, and I do think if around the right coach can at least maximize some of their talent. But a lot of times there are so many people with so many different ideas that it just – honestly, Kevin, one thing I noticed at the Combine – now, granted, I, I just know all the guys with the Chiefs. turns out I know a lot of people with the Ravens. I've been around the Niners forever. There are like seven, eight teams yep. that really got a shot. And then probably half the league has none because whether it's infighting, whether it's bad coaching, whether it's just not being on the same page, whether it's ownership. I I've said this before. You go into a facility of a winning team and on and spend twenty minutes there. Talk to the secretaries, assistants, a couple scouts in the hallway. You get it, like you get it. And it's like anything. Like you walk into Amazon, things are moving smoothly, yeah. everything's going well, and then you go to the startup that's burning through cash and it's about to go out of business. And yeah, things are. You, you can tell. You can tell. And like that's always my thing is that you can tell. On the sideline, I know this sounds like vibes based, but you'll just see, you'll go to these training camps and it's like, nothing's happening. I like to ask the beat writer when I get in, what, whoever the beat writer is in a place. And I'm just like, who are the best players in the team? This is like my, my best gauge. And, and the beat writers know because they're talking to everybody every single day. I say, who are the best players in the team? And if they can't rattle off like four guys immediately, you're done. Like it's, it's all about roster talent. But that's also, I also feel like you can, just watch a practice and just see is everybody moving. And I, 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 want, I want to remember who it was. It was a joint practice. The Patriots are doing joint practice with somebody. Um, Tennessee, maybe. And I remember uh, the the beats of the other team being blown away with how the Patriots operated practice. Blown away. And they're like, nobody's lollygagging and drills, all of this stuff. And it's because you can tell when you watch a team after five seconds whether or not things are going well. And I've heard like Peyton Manning talk about that before. Like you know, after the first play of the season, you can figure out you know, if you have a sharp eye, you're just like, oh, this team's executing, this team's not executing, that kind of thing. So I I, I completely agree with your there's only seven or eight teams hypothesis here. Um I, I remember having, I remember having a buddy on the Eagles, they were joint practicing the Patriots. And, you know, joint practice, everyone shares the field. Yeah, yeah, And he was, you can kind of walk wherever you want. So it, it was in Philly. Yeah. And he was like too close to a Patriot part of practice. They hadn't quite combined yet. And someone on the Patriots walks over to him and he's like, Bill Bill wants you on the other side. <laughs> and the dude's like, this is our field. What the fuck are you talking about? And he got kicked out of his own You're field. in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Bill. Why should you bet with Caesar Sportsbook? Two words, Caesar's Rewards. Every bet brings you closer to the types of benefits only Caesars can offer. Hotel stays, VIP experiences, sports and concert tickets, and more. It's not just an app, it's an empire. What dr- I know this position position specific normally, but like, what are some of the drills you watch in Circle and you're just like, I gotta see this? I do think the 40, it just, it can be overrated for sure with wide receivers. Right, if the guy's a good wide receiver, mm-hmm. I think the kid from Florida State, the Michigan Ke- State transfer, Coleman, Keon Coleman, yeah, ran four six or whatever, four six two. But he is a big, physical, high point guy. His game is much more DeAndre Hopkins. Like that, that's how he's going to have success. So if yeah. you do like him, contested catch guy, yeah, I, I, I didn't, go, I don't love him to be honest with you, but keep which going. can go the other way too. Yeah, you know that's he, he becomes a polarizing guy. But corners, defensive team speed now. You're just not going to find a four six corner 
it, it, I don't care what defense you're running, you're going to get put in a one-on-one spot against a wide receiver, and all these wide receivers can run now. Linebacker. Like, there's no more 4-9 run-stuffing line. Like, those days are over, at least the way the game's currently being played. So spreading the field. So to me, the movement stuff, obviously, you know, any jumping, whether it's vertical or broad jump, for explosiveness matters. So running back, the 40 matters a lot less. How often are you running 40 straight yards? I mean, you average five yards a carry. You're one of the best players in the league, right? So th- th- that's always mattered less. But the the 10 yard split for them, right? How they move, the three cone, their movement it is important. So all this stuff, I say all the time, listen, the draft doesn't determine your success in the NFL. But it is a little bit like if you're buying a home, the inspection, and it does det- help determine the market value for where I have to draft you. Mm-hmm. So if you are a wide receiver that I like and you run an awful 40 time, if I thought you were a second rounder, now I'd probably get you in the third round yeah. right? or maybe the fourth or vice versa. If you go and I, I liked you, I was like, God, can we get this guy in the middle of the second? Mm-hmm. And then he goes and he runs a 4-2-1, the dude from Texas. Yeah, he's probably not going to be there. Pick 50. <laughs> he, uh, that, that has nothing to do with him being the next Jerry Rice or being – Jalen Rager. I have yep. no one knows if we did, we would draft him number one overall. If we knew he was going to be the best player in the league, mm-hmm. but it does determine what I have to pay for you with my draft capital. That's interesting. Or, the, or, or help, or help determine it, yeah. it's a, it's a big factor. I think our feelings dovetail. My, my thing is there's thresholds you need to cross in order to be like, I don't think I know this sounds great. I mean, look, look at the best forties of all time. There's not a lot of studs in there. Um, it's a lot of Dre archers, a lot of John Ross's, right? I think there's a threshold in which you, if you're a quote unquote speed receiver, you better run fast, but it doesn't mean you have to run the the fastest 40 of all time. I think the tape, the tape obviously is number one, then you hit athletic thresholds and then that makes you an elite prospect. Remember Belichick saying this years ago, where it's just like around one player has no question marks around two player has two question marks around three player has three, you know, it's like, you just look look at that stuff. And so for me, the, the, for the testing is just like, are you the player? that I thought you were on tape. And I think that's the most, I think that's the most important thing from the combine. And then you just bet on, I, I, after round one, I would just bet on athleticism, frankly. Um, like I would just take the explosive guys at, at D end. I would take the explosive guys at, at, at linebacker and just hope you can, you can coach that there, there are positions like cornerback where I think explosion matters significantly less offensive line. I fell in love with Andre Dillard and I will never again be, be blown away by a, but, by but a that's where, that's where we, and we talked about this earlier, the intangible stuff. Yeah. So if you're just going to fall in love with the athleticism and he doesn't like football, he's just going to be terrible. Yep. Right. Yep. And that's a consistent theme. But if he's an athleticism guy, loves football, the Packers have been building their team for decades mm-hmm. with football guys with big time traits. And they can, you're going to hit on, you're not going to hit on them all, but you're going to hit on some of them. Right. But if I just bet on the traits, seventh round, whatever, yep. like take a flyer. But second, third round, he better have that work ethic, desire, the staff at UCLA or Oklahoma or whatever. That's where the intangible really matters. And obviously the first round, too. I had a GM, top 10 GM last summer tell me for him, day one and two has become a time of no experimentation. Day three is only experimentation, which I I think is a really interesting way to put it. And I think that that's, um, by the way, Arif Hassan had the funniest line where he, he, he got mad at everybody. Every time I quote an anonymous GM, they say like a great GM and he wants somebody to say like a very stupid GM told me this. I just, I, I, I promise I, let me get this out of here, out of here. Cause uh, Diana Rossini said a very smart GM said it was going to be one through four, uh, at quarterbacks. Yeah, yeah. She had a very smart GM. So I just did that. Unfortunately. Um, I promise you it's, it's a smart, smart GM. who said that, but, but and I also but it, promise next time <laughs> it's a dumb person telling me something. I will source that as well. Here's the thing. Let's say it's, Let's say it's one of the bottom five GM. Yeah. Just a guy that's just not, we all kind of yeah, universally yeah, yeah. agree. He's not very good. Yeah. And then you wrote one of the worst GMs yeah. told me this. That guy's probably going to read that. Yeah. Knows that you're giving, he yeah. gave you that quote. And then he's never talking to you again, which it is, there is value in having the information coming from. I would just GM. say a, a GM. A GM. Yeah. A GM. A yeah. GM. Um, if you say a, a GM, it means it's the dumbest guy I've ever talked to in my life. If I say he's a smart GM, also, by the way, I probably have lumped in in my time in, in using anonymous GM quotes, which isn't very often because I, all my print interviews are on the record and, or, or on the show. We're going to get a bunch of GMs by the way, next month. It's going to be really cool. Um, but uh, I probably, things can lumped, ebb and flow too with those guys. I was going right? to say, I probably Howie, lumped Howie in two years 18, ago, genius, this, 
I probably lumped in 18 GMs currently at, in, as a top 10, as a top 10 I GM. I, had, I actually uh, had a funny moment with Howie. I was doing a story on Andrew Barry, and Andrew Barry said that Howie was the best GM in football. And um, this was after the really crappy year where they had to fire Doug. And um, I said that to Howie. I was like, hey, Andrew Barry thinks you're the best GM in football. And he was just like, you have no idea. Like, he's like, you just can't get caught up in that. I forget what the record was, 6-10. and 10, Or it was like, we went 6-10 and 10 last year. Like, I can't be the best GM in football. Come on. But it's like that stuff ebbs and flows so quickly where it just takes, like, you know, remember Chris Boward's draft class a couple of years ago after the Darius or the Shaq Leonard draft where it's like, uh-oh, Chris Boward's a stud. Super Bowl is coming to Indy. And then three, three years later, Colts are like, is he going to keep his job? Just ebbs and flows. One draft class. John Schneider was supposed to be the best GM of all time in 2014, and then he went through a, a wasteland. I think it's not arguable that Howie's probably the most dynamic. Agreed. He's proven it over a long period of time. Like he says, like two years ago, he looks like a genius. This year, I mean, his team, while it ended, Devis, how many teams would have died to be whatever, 11 wins? Mm-hmm. But, I, you know, it, John Schneider is a good example. Like, I, I think John Schneider, and I think Howie would tell you this. I think John Lynch, I think all the people that are good at their job, less need. I think he's one of the best, but he's mm-hmm. had years. And this is where it goes to. Listen, the Eagles are a good example. They lost two coordinators who are – I actually really impressed with Jonathan Gannon. All my friends with the Eagles love him. He's an impressive guy. And Shane Steichen clearly, like, immediately is – you would think he might as well be one of the Shanahan guys because he's a dominant play caller. And they re, they replaced him with two bad coordinators. Or two guys, definitely the offensive coordinator and the defensive situation was Zesser. Well, now they got two good coordinators again. Definitely Vic is proven to be one of the top coordinators over his time in the NFL. Mm-hmm. I think Kellen Moore is pretty good. He likes passing it. So do the Eagles. So it's like, <laughs> they'll fit in perfectly there. And if those guys are good, Howie will look a lot smarter again mm-hmm. this year. Um, I was going to add, maybe you've already answered this, but uh, one thing I wanted you to prep for. So best drafting GM in football. So what I mean by that is you're an owner and you're just hiring a GM for the draft picks. That's all he's doing. Just picking the players. Who's got the title belt right now? Well, see, to me, the draft is more about just picking the players mm-hmm. it also is working the draft mm-hmm. the value and that to me i i do think and i'm biased but i think veach has proven recently to be the best at picking the players and i think howie's resume of placating the draft and making trades i was at dinner with one of my buddies on the eagles i was like oh how many picks you guys guys like, yeah we got two seconds I'm like where's that second second come from oh that trade we made with the <laughs> saints i'm like didn't you get the first round pick he's like oh yeah the and they gave us a second it's like howie's no one works it better because yeah. no one has more information and no one's better at working the back channels of finding out stuff and knowing value. And that's a huge part. Completely Not that Veach agree. can't, I mean, Veach, if you just put them on the clock and said, pick a player, I'm taking Brett Veach right now. Ooh. Right. I mean, they are what, what they're doing. But if you, if you say like, I need to make some moves, which most teams like to do, I, it's it's not really even close what he's done from a value standpoint of flipping picks and gaining more picks. Just because you make those trades, right? You could tr- the Niners could trade Brandon Ayuk tomorrow for the first and second pick, first round pick and a second round pick. Then they got to pick players with those picks, right? So right. It's, there's two parts to the draft. I completely agree. What does Beach do well? I think you know he's a little wide receiver from Delaware, <clears throat> so he, he is a football guy. Mm-hmm. And I think being around Andy for so long, just like anyone in Philadelphia, you got to spend time around so many different people, players and coaches, that I, I think his understanding of what to look for in a player, and he's not, it's not like he's always been right, but is pretty top-notch. Mm-hmm. And I think the balance of – because I would th- say one thing that Andy has that some teams just don't, he's pretty liberal when it comes to players. right? Like He would mess with the Kelsey brothers when a lot of people wouldn't. There's like a California cool to like, yeah, we can look past that and figure it out. But clearly once you get there, it's a very physical operation. It's definitely not a country club. It's one consistent theme of talking to everyone around the Super Bowl week. It's like, we do not run a country club here. <laughs> this, you know, Andy feels a happy go lucky guy and he is, but it is tough to play there. So the same thing with the Niners. It's, it's just not Javon Hargrave said that about the move, making the move from the Eagles. Yeah. He's like, practice a little harder here. And I, I think understanding of what you're looking for in a guy from a physical characteristic standpoint, which I think mostly can be taught to you, to me, to anybody, but then being around football players and knowing what it looks and sounds like when you're around them and what it, 
the coach is the way they talk about a player. So when I go into an organization or I'm talking to the coordinators or whoever, I feel like this is the type of guy we want. And it, the margins, the difference of a guy we want and don't want, and then specifically have the guy. Because mm-hmm. I, I talked to Beach and he'll come out on the podcast this week. Like No, no it, big deal. You know, Belichick, Belichick forever had like – right pods of guys yeah. like if we trade back there's three or four guys we could take here like they're kind of we got specific players we're taking mcduffie here and if he hadn't been there we would have taken Karlovskis. like we're not trading up for like two or three groups sometimes you do later i'm talking high in the draft we want this guy and i think the eagles do a, they've definitely yeah. since that rager situation have transitioned to that yeah like we want these two guys in our range. Like if you're not drafting in the top five, like there, there's some guessing, but that's where you have to understand the value of players. So specifically we want this guy on our team. Right. And, and I think that's what the best teams, the Ravens have done this yeah. for a long period of time. Come we on. want Kyle Hamilton yep. on, in our organization. He's a Raven. He's a Raven. Yep. Completely agree. Um, most interesting thing you learned from your interviews at the combine. You, you talked to a bunch of GMs. What stood out? Uh, I mean, Jason Lights talked about this, but I I think the the impact Tom Brady had mm-hmm. on his team really showed this year, and I, I think the culture there. Obviously, he got paid, but Mike wanting to stay there, I thought that organization was gonna just a hard blow up and be a disaster. They they transitioned pretty did. well. A lot of people <laughs> did. <laughs> they transitioned well. The other thing is, I, I asked Veach. You know, a huge defining, I would say, attribute of Belichick during his run running the Patriots was being cutthroat and being able to trade, you name it, right? From Bledsoe to uh, Lawyer Malloy all the way through Logan Mankins. And when he tried to trade Rob Gronkowski, he just refused and he retired or whatever. Winning buys you equity, right? And it, it actually helps you make tough decisions. And I asked him, like, do you think now that you guys have all this equity with the fan base, you can make a tougher decision with some of the names that we know that obviously you would like to resign them both, but just might not be part like of the, might not be possible. Mm -hmm. He said, yeah, it does. I mean, that's just, and and Andy, I I think if you just look at some of the guys he's traded over the years, a lot of big names, a lot of big names, Belichick, a lot of people like, people like, I love coach Reed. So Reed's playing the market. Yeah. (laughs) Always been really good at kind of having a guy. And this is where Bill, like, I know you're the, I know you're playing both roles. Where he's like, you know, I let Beach do that, let our calf guy. Like, obviously, if they trade Legarius Sneed, he's he's part of the thumbs up there. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I do think that they can be, they're going to have a lot of parallels. They're just more liked, I think, than the uh, like the Patriot dynasty of kind of doing that over the course of time and, and doing moves that a lot of teams, a lot of bad teams and average teams wouldn't do where I, I think Belichick was able to do what a lot of GMs and owners like, yeah, this is probably the right move mm-hmm. for the next five years. And I, I just think they'll continue to do that. And obviously the one guy, the sacred cow is Patrick. And then as time goes, you just kind of balance everything else, right? Every single player, all, all 21 starters beside him at all times. It's interesting because Greg Popovich has talked about this, about after his first championship, he got to be himself. Because there's all of these things you want to do and, and you can't do until you win. It's a weird stuff. Hey, I want to try this. Or, hey, this guy, I think this guy might be playing out of position, but it'd be a little wacky if I did it. Let's just see what happens. Once you win that first championship, you get about five years where you're able to do whatever you want because people say, well, this guy won a championship. And so um, I completely agree about the equity that you build with the fan base. Now, some of them, like Doug Peterson, didn't get a long runway, but a lot of these guys do. Um, it's, it's a fascinating dynamic about what happens once you – you're not on the climb. You're trying to sustain the culture and you have so many more available options because of, of this, of the, of the goodwill you've, you've built up. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, think about, for example, today, Kelsey leaves retires. That's a big void internally for them. A guy that just could calm everything down. That mm-hmm. puts even more pressure now on Sirianni on mm-hmm. his two new coordinators. Cause as a G as Howie, like it's not like he's given team meetings. A lot of stuff's out of your control. You are very dependent on your team leaders and your coaching staff mm-hmm. once training camp starts. And, and how he even mentioned this, like what's cool about this time of year is like, this is when I impact the team. Mm-hmm. Like this is my role. Once the season starts, like not like I'm giving raw, raw speeches for any GM. 
this is you're just so dependent on your coaches and, and your leaders. And when you lose certain guys like Jason Kelsey, what are you going to do? Like mm-hmm. there is, you, you might even be able to replace them 90% of a player. If you move Dickerson over whoever ends up being their center and it might not be that big a difference, but there's a unquantifiable difference gets back to the human element of you just hope that what he's taught some of these younger guys bringing in Devonte Smith, high character guy, you know, Jalen's leadership can take a step and this could speak for any team like the Cowboys letting Tyron Smith leave more pressure now on Dak, mm-hmm. more pressure on some of those defensive guys. Like in Micah Parsons, you know, is he a gamer and a pass rusher? Or is he like a leader yep. in a pass? You know, it's like, it just becomes more pressure. I've seen it with the Niners. Like they, they just have so many high character, super focused guys. And they were like that when they were really young, that it's just easier to kind of operate under that. The Rams have that, like their best players are just very serious guys. There's a fine line of, the talent and the not serious guy, it can unravel fast. Yep. Uh, rapid fire. We'll get you out of here. Uh, best non quarterback in the draft. I talked to a wide receiver coach that said Roma Dunze. Mm. He said he walked into the room and obviously the other two wide receivers are awesome. He's just like, I love that guy. I, I, I think he, when he walked into that meeting room with some of these coaches was cause it's hard because mm-hmm. everyone's talking about you as like the second or third fiddle. Mm-hmm. Because the other guy's been so famous. He's like a 2 0 or luck. It feels like we've been talking like Marvin Harrison, like he's a quarterback. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of people like Roman. Du- like he might not be the first wide receiver off the board, but I don't think he's lasting past like pick six or seven. I I have heard very similar things. Um, 10 years from now, the best quarterback in the draft is going to be who? In this upcoming draft? This one, yep. Uh, let's go Drake May. Mm. And I didn't even like him when I watched him, but yeah. I'm just going playing the odds. Usually the super hype guy, that guy hits half the time. We know half the other quarterbacks are going to fail. So if I'm just playing the odds, I, I could have said Knicks or Jaden Daniels. I, Drake May was the first name that came to mind. But uh, I, 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 I bet it's someone not named Caleb Williams. And I'm not anti-Caleb Williams. I'm just playing the odds. We're, we're wrong quite a bit. And like – Trevor Lawrence, so not even the line of always, this goes back to something Richard Taylor told me years ago, Richard Taylor from the um, University of Chicago. He, he advised the Browns and stuff like that. But he was like, we talk about Andrew Luck type prospects when not even Andrew Luck was an Andrew Luck type of, had that type of career. Like he, he did not, didn't make a Super Bowl. Like when we, everybody's like, oh, there's no Andrew Luck type. It's like, well, Andrew Luck got, was a great prospect and a great player who got bogged down by the, the, the brutality of football. He, he got injured. The team wasn't good around him. He didn't want to do it anymore. And like, and, and then Trevor Lawrence, same thing, which everybody's Trevor Lawrence, generational prospect. Trevor Lawrence is fine. He's not a top five quarterback. And I don't think he ever will be fine. But what's funny to me, John, is that you can't say any of these guys are just okay. Like if right now, if right now, and I, I actually think they're all, pretty good um but right now if, if i just tweeted i think Jaden daniels is okay just okay i would get murdered for an entire day oh, and destroyed. it's like there's a 25 percent hit rate on these guys to be actually like franchise type of quarterback i'm talking about top five picks i don't even know if 25 percent is generous like i think people use like second contracts as an example um i'd have to look at the, the stats on that but like you can't say i i really like caleb williams i think he's going to be great for the chicago bears but you you literally there, there can be no Twitter evaluations on any of these guys, even though uh, if you have any sort of long memory, half of them are going to be teams are going to be looking to replace somebody in their second year. Well, if you, if you tweeted this, Jaden Daniels will be a bust, right? I mean, your, your mentions for a week would be, I mean, honestly, till the draft and, and through the season, the f- moment he made some plays, the likelihood that you're right in five or six years statistics would be on your side. 50, Look at Baker. 51%. Mayfield. Yeah. You know, Baker's going to get a contract extension. I, I, it's hard to even take an educated guess what that number is right. going to be. Lot. If it's 15 a million a year. If it's 25 million a year, 30 million a year, but he's on his third team. Yeah. He was a number one draft pick. What? 2018. Dude, fourth <laughs> team, fourth team. He was in the Rams. Fourth <laughs> team. He was on the, he was on his fourth team. Yeah. Think yeah. about that. Now, he's not – it's weird because he's clearly not a bust. He's a starting quarterback in the NFL. But you draft the number one overall, and then within, I guess, at the start of last calendar year mm-hmm. of the league year, it was on his fourth team. Yeah. That's a problem. You don't draft the guy that high. Well, what's funny is that 
there's this kind of online culture. Joe Douglas is like, come trade for Zach Wilson. Everyone's like, yeah, we're good. <laughs> Mac Jones. Um, Trey Lance, already gone. Um, but, like, there's this culture of, like, um, I, I don't know. Like, we treat the we have to treat these draft prospects with some benefit of the doubt, which I understand. But teams are so much – the hot take is actually coming from the teams when they don't take these guys and they kill them in draft rooms. And like, draft rooms, as you know, are 500% more what we would call hot take uh oriented oh. than whatever was going on on twitter everyone's all everybody's always like oh these takes on drake may are ridiculous blah 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 and it's like wait till you find out what area scouts and I'm not drake may i'm not I'm, they like him and a lot of stuff but i'm saying like the amount of stuff they say in draft rooms is wild compared to twitter i also think a draft room or just a, a, a an office where yeah. there are scouts and coaches talk a lot like you and i would if we were just Grabbing a beer b-ing over football. About the, our, in, or our industry. Or our industry. <laughs> yeah, you just say some, we we have some nutty thoughts. Yeah. We're all human beings. Like everyone's got opinions. Now right. you kind of know because of social media when to rein it in. Other thing that really bothers me is over the next the course of what 40 days leading up to the draft, there are a lot of articles that come out with unnamed scouts right, yeah. giving their opinions on people back from where McGinn started it. Now everyone kind of pick it because it's a fantastic content. Mm-hmm. Everyone's like, put your name on this guys. They can't, they cannot, they're not allowed to. And we do like, they're not lying. I think 90% mm-hmm. of these 98% of these quotes or what the guy really thinks, but he's not allowed to go John Middlecoff, uh, mm-hmm. Houston Texans, Southwest scout. Like that's not okay, right. but we all love that content. So I think it's very unfair when a lot of people that, report on the nfl then freak out that it's like come on guys like we all know like they're not allowed to if you want to crush a, an unnamed gm okay but even him it would be moronic for him to put his name like yeah this uh roma dunze overrated right i mean that'd be stupid no point on that. um the three now podcast is on the volume um you do a little golf too john middlecoff yeah we will uh we'll talk a lot of golf even though it's kind of sad what has become of uh the great game and the professional game because we got people playing all over the place. It's four tournaments a year matter. And we just, uh, from Greg Norman to Jay Monahan, both bear blame and everything. Well, I'll tell you one thing that didn't change. I played like crap yesterday. That's how it goes. What'd you shoot? Oh, Lord knows. We, we were playing a match. I, we lost an 18. It's fine. Uh, not, not good. Not good is, is what happened. All right. See you later, buddy. Later, Kevin.